Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 2. Today we'll talk a little more about the kinds of acids we can eat and that make a part of all living things. As we've mentioned in previous videos, the amino acids that make up proteins, the nucleic acids in DNA and RNA, and acids like citric acid, acetic acid, and phosphoric acid all have one thing in common. When we add these acids to water, they interact with water in a reversible reaction. For example, if we add acetic acid to water, we get this reaction. An acetic acid molecule reacts with the water to produce an acetate ion and H3O+, which is called the hydronium ion. In fact, every acid reacts with water in a similar way and produces hydronium and another ion. We sometimes write such a reaction without the water, like this, but we only do that to save space when we're writing. It's important to know that the actual reaction of an acid with water always really produces hydronium ions. It's not really possible for us to only have an H plus ion by itself, because a hydrogen atom only contains a proton and an electron. In order to make an H plus ion, we'd have to take away the electron, which means we'd have only a proton by itself. That would be very unstable, so what we really get is the hydronium ion. This kind of reaction, in which an acid reacts with water to form hydronium and another ion, is called an acid dissociation reaction. Every weak acid reacts with water in a similar acid dissociation reaction. For example, here's the formula for benzoic acid. When we add it to water, we get this acid dissociation reaction, where the products are the benzoate ion and hydronium ion. Notice that when a weak acid dissociates, the reaction is always reversible. As you learned back in video number 15, that means it'll eventually reach equilibrium, and we can write an equilibrium expression for the reaction. For example, here's the dissociation reaction for acetic acid again. The equilibrium expression will be this. As we'll see in the next video, acid dissociation reactions are especially important in describing how acid-base reactions happen, so we give the equilibrium constant for an acid dissociation its own symbol, Ka. It also gets its own name, the acid dissociation constant. Let's look at a couple more examples. Here's the reaction with benzoic acid, which we saw earlier. Notice that I'm writing these reactions the short way without showing water as a reactant and writing the product as just H plus instead of writing out the hydronium ion. The equilibrium expression for the reaction is this. We can look up the value of Ka and it turns out to be 6.3 times 10 to the minus 5. You'll find a long list of acid dissociation constants in your textbook in Appendix D. You'll need to use these quite often in class and on the homework. Here's another example where hydrofluoric acid dissociates. Once again, the equilibrium expression has products over reactants, and Appendix D tells us that Ka has a value of 6.8 times 10 to the minus 4. Notice that the two reactions we just looked at have different equilibrium constants. That makes it possible for us to tell which one is a stronger acid. Remember, the equilibrium expression has products over reactants, so the one with the larger value of Ka produces more products, which includes the H+. That means that, of these two acids, the hydrofluoric acid is stronger, because it has a higher value of Ka. One thing you'll notice in Appendix D is that some of the acids have more than one value listed for Ka. For example, here's the listing for phosphoric acid. It's this way because some acids have more than one hydrogen atom that can dissociate from the acid. So, for example, phosphoric acid can lose one hydrogen in this reaction. However, the dihydrogen phosphate ion can lose a second hydrogen in this reaction. And finally, the resulting ion can lose a third hydrogen to form hydrogen and phosphate ions. So overall, three hydronium ions are produced in all, and each of these reactions has a different value for Ka. Notice that the Ka's get smaller and smaller. That's because it's fairly easy for the acid to lose its first hydrogen, but it gets harder and harder to remove more. If you think about it, that makes a lot of sense. Once the first hydrogen has dissociated, the ion that's left has a negative charge. 
In order to lose another hydrogen, the second H plus ion will have to get pulled away from that negatively charged ion. That's hard to do, although it does happen a little. And that's why the second Ka value is smaller than the first one, and the third one is even smaller. Acids like this that can lose more than one hydrogen ion are called polyprotic acids. Some very common acids that you're familiar with are polyprotic acid, like citric acid, which can lose up to three hydrogens, and ascorbic acid, called vitamin C, which can lose two hydrogens. Many amino acids are also polyprotic acids. So far, we've only been talking about weak acids, but weak bases also dissociate in water. For example, here's ammonia, which reacts in water to form ammonium and hydroxide ions. Unlike the case with acid dissociation reactions, when we have a base, we can't shorten the reaction by leaving out the water. We need to show water as a reactant, because that's where we get the hydroxide ion that makes this a base. All weak bases combine with water in a reaction similar to this one, which is called a base dissociation reaction. And just like acid dissociation reactions, we can write an equilibrium expression for this one. In this case, we write products over reactants and get this. Remember, we don't include liquids in our equilibrium expression, so we leave out the water. Just like acids, the equilibrium constants for the dissociation of bases is so useful it gets its own symbol, Kb, and its own name, the base dissociation constant. It'll be important for you to be able to write dissociation reactions for both acids and bases so that we can delve more deeply into acid-base reactions. We'll spend some time working on that in class and on the homework. And that's enough new material for today. We're now ready to use everything we've learned in the last few videos about reversible reactions, equilibrium, and pH to really apply those concepts and perform precise calculations that'll help us see exactly what happens in an acid-base reaction. We'll start doing that in the next video. So until then, have a good week.